All I remember was he was working there at the table and for all I can go, well, I, I, I was there, like, he could have been writing anything, you know. He was a relatively young man in those days and, of course, I was only a chiseler and uh, he, he, he was, if you like, my big brother and um, he, 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 he looked after me, if you like, and, and he was a very kind person. And uh, when I became a student in the College of Art, my mother was very worried about, about, I mean, I mean, going into this business that, I mean, she, was, she used to say to me a long time, why don't you get a job, you know? And uh, Brian one time went into the College of Art and met the director, who was Michael Burke, who lived actually up in, in Leonard's Avenue there in front of us. And he actually asked Michael Burke to show him my, my portfolio, which he did. And Brian told my mother, you needn't worry about this man at all. <laughs> so, and I only heard that very recently. So, I mean, he was keeping an eye on things all the time. For people who didn't know Michal, what, what, were, what were his other qualities? Because people, you know, would tend to only know what, what they've read or what they've, or tend to know him through the columns or something. What were his personal qualities? Well, you see, one of his, one of his great qualities was to help people. And there are an awful lot of people who he helped with jobs and he got into, to help people to solve all kinds of problems. And he was very kind to people. You see, many people have a memory of him as in his very later years, as being an impossible drunk or somebody who was obstreperous and wrong. But I mean, that was not the man that I knew at all, not even remotely. And, and that's, that's unfortunate, but, but that's the way it happened. Well, but the man you knew was a completely different man, was a kind oh, gentleman. Oh, absolutely, a totally different man. And I mean, he may have become a little soured about this, that, the other thing, but I think it all goes back to the rejection of his book, which was his best work, and I mean, that could affect any artist. My uncle drained away the remainder of his tea and arranged his cup and saucer in the centre of his bacon plate, in a token that his meal was at an end. He then blessed himself and sat for a time drawing air into his mouth with a hissing sound in an attempt to extract foodstuff from the crevices of his dentures. Subsequently, he pursed his mouth and swallowed something a boy of your age, he said at last, who gives himself up to the sin of sloth. What in God's name is going to happen to him when he goes out to face the world? Boys, but I often wonder what the world is coming to. I do indeed. Tell me this. Do you ever open a book at all? I open several books every day, I answered. You open your granny, said my uncle. Oh, I know the game you're at above in your bedroom. I'm not as stupid as I look. I'll warrant you that. I remember, remember the time my father died, you see. And I was actually in, in the room next door to my father's down there. And, um, and I remember my sister coming in and telling me that, 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 that Acher, that we call her father Acher, which is Irish for father, and... Uh, she said, Acher went to heaven last night. But this affected Brian very, very deeply as well, you see. And he decided, you see, he had a Morris 8 at the time, because he was in, he just joined the civil service, he had a Morris 8. And he took me and my younger brother out for a drive. And the, and the, and the purpose of this was to tell us that you won't see your father anymore, you see. So we drove up the mountains, and he didn't know how to put it exactly. And he'd say, look at the trees, and we'd look at the trees, and then he'd say, look at the sheep, and we'd look at the sheep. And eventually he pulled up outside a pub, and he went in. And then he came out again, and then he drove away, and he said, you know, he said, and this was all in Irish, of course, which is the language of our house, you know, he said, you won't see your father anymore. And I said... Immediately, but you can't be going and look at him in the in the room, and of course, this ruined this was this ruined his story. And of course, that was the end of that, and then he just drove home. He knew that he he had made a mess of it, you know. And this is like the Regis Digest used to the used to used to publish thing, the perfect squelch, and this was what it was. <laughs> However, that was one little anecdote. Anyway. What do you remember about his own death? Well. They, they, he, well, I remember that, that um, 
he was getting treatment for cancer and he was in, in, in Luke's hospital and that, you know, it was only a matter of time and that. Um, and I remember going to see him and bringing him in a bottle of whiskey and um, he said to me, he said, I, you, you, I don't know what to do, you know, he didn't know what to do. So, I mean, fortunately for him, you see, he had a cancer that he would have literally choked to death. And fortunately, he had a heart attack which put an end to that, so that was the end of that. So I often like to think of him as, as you know, when, Saint, when he meets St. Peter, St. Peter would have said to him, is it about a bicycle? When I penetrated back to the day room, I encountered two gentlemen called Sergeant Pluck and Mr. Gilhanny, and they were holding a meeting about the question of bicycles. I do not believe in the three-speed gear at all, the sergeant was saying. It is a newfangled instrument. It crucifies the legs. The half of the accidents are due to it. It's a power for the hills, said Gilhanny, as good as a second pair of pins or a diminutive petrol motor. It's a hard thing to tune, said the sergeant. You can screw the iron lace that hangs out of it till you get no catch at all on the pedals. It never stops the way you want it. It would remind you of bad jaw plates. About the bicycle, said Gilhanny. The bicycle will be found, said the sergeant, when I retrieve and restore it to its own owner in due law and possessively. Would you desire to be of assistance in the search? He asked me. I would not mind, I answered. In case we do not come up with the bicycle before it is high dinner time, said the sergeant, I have left an official memorandum for the personal information of Policeman Fox so that he will be acutely conversant with the res ipsa, he said. Do you hold with rat trap pedals? asked Gilhanny. Who is Fox? I asked. Policeman Fox is the third of us, said the sergeant. But we never see him or hear tell of him at all, because he is always on his beat and never off it, and he signs the book in the middle of the night when even a badger is asleep. He's as mad as a hare, he never interrogates the public, and he is always taking notes. If rat trap pedals were universal, it would be the end of bicycles. The people would die like flies. Looking back now, Michal, what do you remember about of Brian? What, are, are there any particular things that, that you remember? You know, I, I, I assume you think of him every day and in, in some way or another. And, you know, what little things or what things is it, is it about? Well, well he, used to, he used to always, he used to always play, play a few records. He used to have particular records he used to play and he used to play these records. And um, one of them was, I, I remember the girl from the County Clare, one of one of them, what he called um, Percy French, one of Percy French's songs, and he used to play another them on, you will remember Vienna, because he had been to Vienna. So, but, but he, he, of course, played serious music, like Beethoven's music and so on, and some of Mozart's music. But, I mean, he, 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 he was a very private sort of a person. But, I mean, when he lambasted, his people as he did in this column and he, he 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 was really trying to to um show up what, what was false and wrong in irish life when things go wrong and will not come right though you do the best you can when life looks black as the hour of night a pint of plain is your only man when money's tight and is hard to get and your horse has also ran when all you have is a heap of debt a pint of play is your only man. When health is bad, and your heart feels strange, and your face is pale and wan, when doctors say that you need a change, a pint of plain is your only man. When food is scarce, and your larder bare, and no rashers grease your pan, when hunger grows as your meals are rare, a pint of plain is your only man. In time of trouble and lousy strife, You've still got a darling plan. You can still turn to a brighter life. A pint of plain is your only man. That was the opening programme in our new four-part series dedicated to the life and work of Brian O'Nolan, alias Flann O'Brien, alias Miles Nagopoline. The reader was Daniel Reardon. Next week, Alan Titley assesses the impact Flann O'Brien's first novel, The Poor Mouth, had on Gaelic literature and its proponents at the time. Next Tuesday evening at 7.30.